throughout history, many strive to be in the public's eye, while others reluctantly and sometimes unexpectedly just seem to end up there. Where did they come from? What made them so special? And what secrets did they hide till the end? I'm your host, Ed Doyle, and these are tales of fame and fate. The human brain, a magnificent complex organ that is presumed to be the number one central part of our bodies that makes us who we are. It determines our personality, our drive, our abilities as humans to learn, to adapt, to strive to reach our goals and dreams and become more than who we were yesterday and better than who we are today. Yet with the billions of dollars, extensive research, and countless studies of the human brain, it remains a mysterious and still very unknown part of what makes us, us. The one thing we do know, but don't fully understand, is that it doesn't take much to upset that perfectly balanced, fine-tuned process of the brain that keeps us being who we are. In this tale of fame and fate, we're going to look at one such example of someone whose powerful, creative, and exceptional mind made him into one of the most energetic and captivating entertainers of our time. Then, without warning, something attacked him from within and unmercifully destroyed the precious mind of Robin Williams. Robin McLaurin Williams was born on July 21st, 1951. Born at St. Luke's Hospital in Chicago, Illinois to parents Lori and Robert Williams. Robin's father, Robert Williams, was a well-paid vice president of the Lincoln Mercury Division of the Ford Motor Company. His mother, Lori, was a former fashion model, an accomplished tennis player, and an actress in the 1950s. The Williams family was more than financially sound. At six years old, Robin's family moved to Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, into a 40-room mansion which sat on 20 acres of land. Robin had a whole floor of the mansion for himself, including the basement, where he would bring his toy soldiers and create personalities and voices. But Robin was not an overly happy child. Robin attended private school at Detroit Country Day School. He was a slightly overweight child, and he would often be bullied in school. He had no friends and would often return home crying. He had once said that the sixth grade was the most difficult year of his life. With having to find a way to mentally deal with his troubles at school, it was at this young age that Robin Williams found that comedy could actually ease situations and make him happy. His mother, Lori, had a very sharp wit about her, and when scolding or having discussions with Robin, she would often use humor that was laced with bits of sarcasm. He picked up on this fast and had said that he felt he had to find ways to make his mother laugh. He had to be funny, he thought. By the age of 16, the Williams family moved to Tiburon, California. It was here at Redwood High School that the shy, tightly wrapped Robin Williams finally began to loosen up. It was the latter half of the 1960s in San Francisco, and Robin was now surrounded with a whole new culture of sex and drugs. His first taste of this new environment was when he started trying marijuana. And now, beginning to loosen up, he started finally fitting in with other students, so he thought. Robin got involved with wrestling and soccer, but he found his true passion in the drama department. It was here that he found he loved improv and that he was very good at it. He became the class clown, and every moment of the day, he would continue to hone those skills. When Robin Williams graduated high school, it was not surprising at all that he was voted the funniest student by his class. He was, however, also voted 
the least likely to succeed. Robin went on to attend Claremont Men's College, but it wasn't theater that he wanted to major in. Instead, it was political science. Robin Williams had always held a very liberal view, and perhaps at that time, he may have thought that he could make a name for himself in the world of politics. But it didn't take long though at all that he would be spending most of his time not in lectures and classes, but in and around the drama department. Robin decided to enroll in the College of Marin, a community college in Kentfield, California. It was here that he would continue to hone his skills as a comedian and an actor. After three years, Robin Williams was offered a fully paid scholarship to the Juilliard School of Performing Arts in New York City. Robin amazed his teachers at Juilliard and his fellow students with his ease of switching personas and his unending reserves of energy. Robin's classmate Christopher Reeves, who would later go on to become Superman in the movies, said that Robin was like an untied balloon that had been inflated and immediately released. Reeves said that he had never before seen so much energy in one person, but Robin was getting frustrated at Juilliard. With his boundless energy and his unique talents, Robin again felt that he just didn't fit in there. After just two years, his teacher told him that there was nothing more that they could teach him. And in 1976, Robin Williams left Juilliard. Ready to take on the world, Robin moved back to San Francisco, but unfortunately, he could not find work where he could show off his passions and talent. So instead, he got a job at the Holy City Zoo, waiting tables and bartending. Then, finally, at the Holy City Zoo, he got his chance to get out from behind the bar and get up on stage. From that first performance, Robin Williams was a hit. His act was called sensational and amazingly energetic. Throughout the beginning of Robin Williams' career, and even in his school years, many people had said that they often felt that Robin was a bit reserved, perhaps even a little depressed. It was tough for him as a child. He had a very strict father that demanded perfection from everyone. He was overweight and bullied in his early school years, and he had a personality that never really fit in with others. That's a lot for a young man to carry around and deal with. Robin had said in an interview later in life that these school years were the absolute hottest years of his life. He said that later in high school was when he truly learned about drugs and happiness. He also said that unfortunately it was also the time of his life where he saw the best minds of his time turn to absolute mud. Robin expanded on how tough it was in the beginning to be a young comic trying to make his way. Wild parties, drugs, alcohol. One minute you're on top, the next minute you're at the bottom clawing your way back up. Was this newly found fame starting to take its toll on Robin? Or was it simply life's tests and challenges that someone in that position has to face and choose a path to determine their fate? Robin's energy and unique style in his career was about to take off into the stratosphere with everyone wanting him to perform for their specials or in their comedy clubs. He got his first movie role even before he appeared on the television show Happy Days for his introduction as Mark from Ork. In 1977, Robin was offered a part of an attorney and of a hillbilly with a toothache. In the movie, Can I Do It Till I Need Glasses? A poorly written sequel to the comedy movie, If You Don't Stop It, You'll Go Blind. Robin was paid $150 for his two short skits in the movie, and it really was a waste of his talent. His scenes were cut originally from the movie. The movie failed to even pay for itself. But when Robin Williams landed his new starring role on television's Mork and Mindy, the movie's producer searched for, then found, the deleted Robin Williams scenes and edited them back into the movie and re-released it, giving Robin Williams top billing 
as though he was the star of the film. Robin Williams sued the movie and its distributors for false and misleading advertising. The Happy Days episode was originally a one episode spot for Williams, but the audience loved him and they demanded more. And because of the letters and calls from viewers wanting more episodes with Mork, they decided to create a spin-off series called Mork and Mindy. Much of Robin's performance was off the cuff as writers gave him plenty of room to do just what he wanted because they felt it was hilarious. Robin Williams was almost overnight catapulted into superstardom. Williams wasn't ready mentally though, and with the fame comes temptation. He indulged in women, alcohol, and drugs. He would be out all night and then have to be on the set of Mark and Mindy the next morning. As he was burning himself out physically, his mental state was about to be in for a big change also. One night after a performance in a comedy club, Williams met up with a fellow comic named John Bellucci. They ended up that night at the Chateau Marmont where he joined in and shared some of the cocaine that Bellucci offered him. The next day he was given the news that John Bellucci, his friend, was dead from a drug overdose. Not only was Robin devastated from the death of a friend, but he also had to appear in front of a grand jury. These combined with the birth of his first child, Zach, convinced him that it was time to make a change. He broke away from the drugs and the alcohol and decided to start taking care of himself. His first marriage to Valerie Villardi in 1978 lasted eight years. She had put up with his drugs and wild lifestyle and she was happy that with the birth of their son, Zach, that he changed his life around. Unfortunately, however, he didn't change it completely around as he ended up having an affair with a cocktail waitress that actually ended up suing Williams for $6.4 million, claiming that he had knowingly given her herpes. A few months later, Valerie sued for divorce. In 1989, Williams married again, this time to Marsha Garces, who was the former nanny to his son, Zach. The couple had two children together, a daughter, Zelda Ray, and a son, Cody Allen. The marriage lasted 19 years, but alas, Robin would relapse into his addictions, and eventually they would get divorced. His professional life, however, was more than he could have ever hoped for. Many people disliked Robin Williams, perhaps because of his lifestyle, perhaps because they were just too uncomfortable around anyone with that much energy. He went on to star in movies, Popeye in 1980, The World According to Gop in 1982, The Survivors in 83, and Moscow on the Hudson in 1984. And on and on with a nonstop string of movies, The Best of Time, Club Paradise, Seize the Day, and Good Morning Vietnam. Then 64 more movies that he would either star in or have cameo appearances in. In 2011, Robin would marry one final time. His new bride was Susan Schneider, a graphic designer. They met shortly before Robin would go in for heart surgery where he had to have his aortic valve replaced. They got together and she actually helped nurse him back to health. But this was only the beginning of Robin's medical problems. In 2013, it became apparent that Robin was suffering from something that doctors could not truly identify. Robin's doctors chased multiple symptoms. Susan Williams said it reminded her of the game Whack-A-Mole Symptoms would pop up and lead you to believe it might be this or that. Then they would disappear and new symptoms would emerge. Robin would start seeing a host of doctors, general physicians, neurologists, psychiatrists, hypnotherapists, physical trainers, and many other specialists. Everyone thought it was something different, but not one of them could find anything. When the serious pain started in his gut, he was tested for diverticulitis. But again, the test came back negative. 
Susan had said that when the pain had finally subsided that she noticed that Robin's fear and anxiety spiked like she had never seen in him before. Robin would suffer from movement disorders, rigid muscles and pain, confusion, memory loss, sleep problems, exhaustion, depression, loss of motivation, and more. Susan actually began to wonder if she had married a hypochondriac. He suffered from constipation, urinary difficulty, hot burns, sleeplessness, and insomnia, a poor sense of smell, and lots of stress. But all the tests they ran came back negative. She said, except for high cortisol levels, they could find nothing wrong with him. In the spring of 2014, doctors said they believed that he was suffering from early stage Parkinson's disease. Robin was put on a regimen of medications combined with an antidepressant. Susan said that she felt that she was watching her husband disintegrate before her eyes and that no one could get to the bottom of what was wrong and help him. Susan and Robin were to attend a friend's birthday party. And when she went into the bedroom, Robin Williams was lying on the bed crying. He looked at her and said through tears, I just want to reboot my brain. On August 11th, 2014, Robin would be found in the closet of his bedroom with a belt around his neck. Robin Williams was gone. Robin Williams was cremated and his ashes were scattered across the San Francisco Bay. His body may be gone, but his story lives on. Doctors found during his autopsy that he was suffering from Lewy body disease, sometimes referred to as Lewy body dementia. LBD is a neurodegenerative brain disease that is characterized by the abnormal buildup of proteins that attack the brain cells. There are no tests to diagnose it. There are no treatments that can slow it or stop it. Those that have been diagnosed with it after their deaths have been found to have had no family history of it. And worse yet, there are no genes that can be linked to it. So did Robin Williams always have this disease hiding dormant inside of him, just waiting to strike? Or could something else have caused this horrible attack on his mind and body? Being on location for so many movies and so many environments, is it possible that he, without even knowing, might have been bitten by a tick carrying Lyme disease and one or more of the many co-infections that come with Lyme? Early symptoms might have been seen as the flu or just the result of his lifestyle, hangovers, you know, the after effects from his drug and alcohol addictions. Sound far-fetched or crazy? Well, I can tell you from personal experience, along with hundreds of thousands of others, that it may not be crazy at all, but pretty darn right on target. Like tens of thousands of other people that suffer with undiagnosed Lyme, I too played that whack-a-mole symptom and misdiagnosis game for several years until I was finally diagnosed with Lyme disease and a co-infection. Like Robin, I was tested for Parkinson's, MS, lupus, RA, and a host of other tests that all came back negative. Pain medications and antidepressants, like what Robin was prescribed, are the number one go-to from doctors that cannot identify what is happening to those that have contracted Lyme disease. Lyme can stay dormant for a long time as it hides itself from the body's own defense mechanism by going into stealth mode, hiding in biofilms that it creates to protect itself from our own antibodies. All the while, reproducing quietly and infecting the body and the brain. I can tell you from personal experience that once it gets to a certain level, it attacks with a vengeance. Lyme disease left untreated causes the same symptoms that Robin Williams suffered, especially the brain fog, the confusion, 
the loss of memory, the exhaustion, and especially the fear and anxiety as he suffered. I can tell you again from personal experience that the fear and anxiety would wake you up in the middle of the night in terror, unable to think, unable to concentrate, in tears, fearing that my brain was about to melt down and I would end up in a ward in a hospital, tied down to a bed. Only those that have experienced undiagnosed Lyme disease can even imagine that level of fear and emotional pain. Dr. Robert Bransfield, a psychiatrist from New Jersey, wrote in a medical journal that he firmly believes that through his studies, that in 2015, as many as 1,200 people that took their own lives 14,000 incidents of self-harm and over 31,000 of those that attempted to take their own lives may indeed be attributed to Lyme disease. I was one of the lucky ones, as many others have been too. Finally and correctly diagnosed with Lyme and one or more co-infections, mine having been Babesia, I got treatment in time. I did, however, succumb to a heart problem requiring an ablation and what the doctors thought was a TIA or mini stroke, but they could find no answer as to why. They did find, however, white spots on my brain scan. Again, no explanation. Just a few of it could have been this or it could have been that. There's nothing to worry about. You see, Lyme, chronic Lyme, also produces high cortisol levels and they are now discovering proteins building up in the brain, possibly from the biofilms produced by the Lyme bacteria. Am I and others that have been treated for Lyme disease cured? No one really knows. Is it just lying dormant again, waiting to strike when it's too late? Could this have truly been the monster that went undiagnosed and eventually destroyed Robin Williams? To all of those questions, no one really knows. Lyme disease, Lewy body disease, and other neurological degenerative diseases need so much more research, and it needs to happen now. There is something that every one of us can do to help, and it's not just by supporting monetarily. No, it's called paying attention. Don't ignore those that need your help. Don't dismiss them away thinking it was their lifestyle that caught up with them or that it's all in their head. Every one of you, every one of your children, no matter how healthy or wealthy that you might be, can without warning be bitten by an infected tick or without reason develop something like LBD. Spread the word. Learn more and ask questions. And most of all, demand answers for Robin, for me, and for hundreds of thousands of others, and for yourself. Lyme disease and other diseases like LBD is not something you want to acquire fame for. And you certainly do not want it to be your fate.